Today I'm trying something new. First off, I'm doing a video in English and second, I'm reviewing my own car. This 2002 Mercedes SL55 has been my own car for two years and I've decided it's about time to sell it now because I'm a car guy and I want something else. And in the same moment, I think it would be interesting to tally up all the costs I've had in this car and do like a little total cost of ownership calculation. So I will, we will start the video with me driving around and reviewing the car and at the end we will come back here and I will basically show you a list of all the items I've had with the car, all the expenses, how much it cost me to run it and in general talk a bit about car ownership in Switzerland. So thank you and enjoy. So why did I buy this car? Well, on the one hand, I really like convertibles, even though I shouldn't because people with no hair cannot stay out in the sun without wearing a hat. This is why I have a stupid hat in the car that I will not show you. Also, I had the previous generation Mercedes SL, the R129, which is a really lovely car, but for my use, it was a bit too old fashioned meaning it had really indirect steering and even worse for me um, the seating position was quite cramped whereas in this car for a person of my height I'm 1 meter 84 it's really comfortable speaking of comfort the SLs aren't usually really that sporty of sports car they are more like you know luxury cruisers with some power and I think this car makes no exception the ride is really good but still hard so it's not like a for example an s-class where the ride is really smooth this is more hard you're more connected to the road but it's still more comfortable than you would expect from a sports car this all comes from the infamous ABC suspension that this car has a system called active body control and what is this basically it's a hydropneumatic suspension um, that's very similar to what Citroen uses in their cars. In fact, this car can be raised and lowered by, I think, about six centimeters on the push of this button, which is very handy since it is a relatively low car. And if you go up a curb or something like that, you can raise the car. Great. I use it all the time. I actually have to use it to get out of my garage without doing any damage. The ABC system is infamous because when it fails, it's really, really expensive to fix. This is why some people have opted to um, convert the car to normal struts. Doing that, I think the car loses a lot of appeal because uh, the good part of the ABC system, it's actually a really advanced active suspension system that eliminates the yaw and that actually works really well you can even put it in a sporty mode where it does it a lot harder but basically this is a relatively comfortable car that doesn't yaw speaking of expensive maintenance this car when it came out in 2002 it had the world first electronic brakes a system called SBC the Sensotronic Brake Control which means the brake pedal is not physically connected to the brakes. It all happens through a pump and electronics, which means whenever this pump fails, and it will fail, because the pump has a certain number of actuations it allows, and once that is reached, it will basically put a message on the display saying, okay, brakes service needed, and then you have to replace the pump. The pump cannot be reconditioned, um, it could be reset it, but if you reset it, it might fail at some point. So that's an expensive maintenance item that needs to be handled at some point, needs to be tackled at some point. The brakes, while being electronic, they still deliver a really, really good pedal feel. And they are very nice and modulable. It's, they're really good brakes. This being an older Mercedes, everything is operated by vacuum meaning 
the central locking system it works by vacuum the trunk lock works by vacuum the locks for these these boxes and cubby holes and stuff work by vacuum so if you have a vacuum leak somewhere in your system your doors won't close anymore whereas basically every other manufacturer used uh, electric motors mercedes relied on vacuum i mean it can work well but when it goes wrong it's a bit of a pig to sort out the issues another part of the appeal of this car is the folding metal roof meaning when you close the roof it's pretty much like a coupe so you get less noise than you would in a normal convertible and i think the car really looks good when it's closed which is also not very usual for a convertible car speaking about looks i think this generation sl is the last of the pretty sls up until that point mercedes sls have been really really pretty cars but then already when they facelifted this made it square up front while remaining round at the back it kind of created an imbalance and at some point with the next generation they actually managed to do a car that's actually uh, ugly so yeah there is a point to speak for this car but of course it was designed by an Italian legendary Mercedes designer Bruno Sacco which in Italian literally means brown bag still a very very good designer if you ask me and he did some really timeless designs for Mercedes-Benz another reason why I bought this car of course was the AMG engine this car being an SL55 has a 5.4 liters V8 engine with a supercharger it produces 500 horsepower you could drive this car quite swiftly without ever going over 3000 revs but even if you go over 3000 revs the engine keeps on delivering it's actually really nice because it's a rather large engine that still manages to rev manages to be fun at high revs plus it sounds really good handling wise the car handles well but it is a heavy car it's almost two tons and you feel it when you drive it I mean it doesn't give you the feeling of being light and nimble it gives you the feeling of being like heavy but at the same time the car can handle really nice but it's not necessarily instilling you the confidence to drive it at the limit another thing that also in my opinion limits drivability is that this car does not have a limited slip differential because I mean only Mercedes-Benz can think it's a good idea to build a 500 horsepower car and not equip it with a limited slip differential that's insane I mean sure the car has ASP and ASR and all sorts of traction control gadgetry which means you will probably not spin out in this car if you don't drive it like a fool but also when it's rainy when it's slippery when even in the middle of a corner on a dry day the car has trouble putting the power down so the electronics will cut the power and you will not drive as fast or as well as you would actually like to do the SL55 when it came out it was the first Mercedes road car with like shifting buttons or pedals or whatever you want to call those on the steering wheel to um, change gears for the automatic transmission and it's funny because this is so common nowadays but back then it was such a novelty that they actually had to put these like plus and minus signs on the steering wheel to show people like ooh here you can you can go to a higher gear here can, you can go to a lower gear so like wow and it works okay if you drive like a curvy road like I'm doing now it's good you can pre-select your gear and it will hold that gear until the rev limit so then it will automatically shift but basically it's basically meant for pre-selecting your gear rather than for doing quick shifting because it doesn't shift quickly I mean if I shift now 
now with the gears change. So yeah, there's a lot of delay. You shouldn't like use it like a dual clutch transmission or maybe like a modern automatic transmission, but it's still workable for pre-selecting the gear. I know there's a tight corner, I shift down and then the gear is ready. I can do the corner, lose some traction and then shift up. The funny thing is if you want to use the buttons on the steering wheel to change the gears, you basically have to put it into manual mode. Because if you're in automatic mode, like I'm now, the buttons do nothing. You have to go to winter, then to manual mode, and then you can shift gears manually. Again, this is an old car and this is basically where it mostly shows. But I think for the type of car, it's okay. Because most of the time, the automatic transmission, it's a five speed, will do a really, really good job. In normal driving, you almost never drive with the buttons. And when you drive on a nice curvy road like I am, they work fine. It's just, it's not suited for maximum attack and because in general, this is not a maximum attack kind of car. This is a car you drive more leisurely, you enjoy the sound, you enjoy the power. You just have a good time. And I think in this regard, the car is very, very capable. As a matter of fact, this is in general a very, very capable car. Because in the two years that I've owned it, I basically used it as a daily driver in the summer. I wouldn't want to drive this car in the winter because of the problems I mentioned before with the traction. As, as soon as it's slippery, as soon as it's icy, the car has serious, serious traction issues. And in Switzerland, you know, winters can be a bit harsher than maybe in Southern California. On the other hand, if it didn't have these traction problems, I think this would be a really, really good winter car because actually like all Mercedes convertibles, it has a really, really, really good heating system. Meaning it heats really quickly and really well, which is, of course, needed if you have a convertible because you might want to drive it with the roof open even when the weather is not that great. And due to the good heating system, due to the good heated seats, a Mercedes SL is actually a convertible you can drive with the roof open if you close the windows like I do now, even when it's like 10 degrees outside Celsius. Again, this I think is a very, very competent car. Not only is it like fun to drive, enjoying the, the sun, enjoying the weather, the sound of the engine, but also you go on the motorway, you close the roof and it becomes a very, very capable long distance cruiser. I've been to Italy twice with it, driven like 1,200 kilometers a day and it's been really good. Well, except that in, on both trips the car had to come back on a, on a flatbed, but that's a different story that I'm gonna tell later on. It's, in general, it's a really, really nice car. I think also the interior, it looks very nice. It's made with nice material. It's all leather and, well, probably leatherette on the lower part. And for a 16-year-old car, I think it held up well. What didn't hold up so well, of course, is the infotainment system. I mean, yeah, it's a CD-based navigation system. And uh, the last map update, I think, is from 2010. So it's pretty much useless. I usually just use my phone for navigation, much better. The SL55 also comes with the AMG Sport seats, which are like really, really comfortable seats that actually hug you in the right places. They hold you in well and they are, you know, adjustable in every way imaginable. What's also nice, they are cooled, they are heated and they have a massage function. Even though I have to say the massage function not great, especially if you've driven one of the more uh, recent Mercedes, like for example an, uh, a recent E-Class with the AMG seats, those seats have amazing massages. Anyway, it has it, better than nothing, and of course, all the massage is vacuum operated. So it's operated by the same pump that operates the uh, central locking system and uh, the boot. Kick down.
this car, since I bought it very used, at the time I bought it, it was already 14 years old. As you might imagine, it's not completely standard. In fact, it has a different exhaust of a brand called Roar, which I've personally never heard. And I think it sounds okay-ish. I mean, I know how the normal 55 AMG sounds and that car sounds awesome. And I think this car with this exhaust sounds a bit worse. So the previous owner, I don't know what he was after, but I think he made it worse than it would have been factory. Also, this car comes with 19-inch uh, Brabus wheels, which I think are really nice. Certainly nicer than the 18-inch wheels it would have come on. Of course, I also had to do a few modifications to the car. Among which, the first I did was I installed a comfort module for the roof. Meaning, you can open and close the roof while you're in motion. And I think this is absolutely critical for one of these convertibles that you can like close a roof or open it when you're not completely stationary. Because imagine it, you're at a traffic stop, it's red, you think, okay, I'm gonna open the roof, and then it turns green. What do you do? You have to either interrupt the process, which you can't, because it has to either close again or open again, or you have to keep standing at a green light until your roof is open, which everybody behind you will hate. Whereas with a module like this, you can slowly drive away while the roof keeps opening and you're good to go. When it's time, when it's closed, you accelerate on, you're gone. Another modification I did, I added a dancing gateway 500, which is basically an MP3 player that you can connect to the entertainment system. And it's really good. I mean, it doesn't display titles, but it can play thousands of songs. You can have hundreds of folders. You just have to be really organized and you know have it alphabetically because otherwise you will never find a song but i think that makes it so much more usable because nowadays if you have a car without bluetooth without um, mp3 cap capability it's not really great this sl used to come with a nokia cell phone so it actually had the nokia 6210 cell phone that you can put into a holder here thankfully there's a company called viseo they make Bluetooth adapters that fit into those Nokia 6210 cradles and then you can connect your smartphone via Bluetooth to it and use the car's inbuilt hands-free phone, which is a really good thing. Makes, again, an old car like this usable with modern devices. Now let's talk about costs. What has this car cost me in the two years of ownership that I've had? And like any proper car nerd, I prepared a spreadsheet. I bought this car in 2016 for 20,000 Swiss francs, which was a good price back then, but I got it at such a good price because the roof did not open. And I figured out immediately it was the guides for the little flaps that close on the tunnel cover. And this is a common problem. You can buy them from Mercedes-Benz. They have an improved version now. It costs like 80 Swiss francs to do so. Okay. But this was also the first thing I did after I bought the car. I bought those roof rails. Actually, they cost 71 francs and 28 cents. I did... Actually, another thing that I did immediately after buying it, I removed the automatic shifter and removed the um, shifter lock. Because Mercedes-Benz of this vintage, this shifter, the shifter lock that prevents you from changing into, into gear or into neutral when the car is uh, locked, it's made out of plastic and it breaks. And when it breaks, you won't get the car out of the park anymore. So, since mine was starting to break, I had to wrestle the car out of park. I decided to remove it immediately in order not to remain stranded. I then, later on, I bought a replacement lock, one made out of metal, and installed that. That shifter lock cost me 52 francs. 
because I installed it myself and it was a pig and I did it twice. But anyway, now it's perfect. Shifter lock is in it. The car is all right the way it should be and it's made out of metal. It should never break again. Then I bought the Dungeon Gateway 500, the MP3 player for the entertainment system. That was 272 Swiss francs. I bought the comfort module for the roof to allow it to open and close while in motion. That was 250 Swiss francs. Also, this is all right after buying the car. One of the side covers on the side of the rear windshield was, uh, had a crack in it, so I replaced that. That was 102 Swiss francs. In September of that same year, I had to buy new tires because when I bought the car, it came with tires that were like not in great condition. But, you know, in, at the beginning of August, I looked at them and said, yeah, you know, I'm going on holidays with those. And then when I come back, I'll replace them. Yeah, turns out I should have replaced them before because while I was driving back from Italy, tire blew on the motorway, nothing happened. I, I, I parked a car on the side of the road, everything was good, but I had to drive home in a rental car because of course it was a Sunday and 275 millimeter tires were not available. And yeah, I had to work the next day. So the car came back on a trailer about four weeks later and I bought a new set of tires. Good Bridgestone S001, it cost me a thousand francs, fitted and everything. Yeah, that's what it is. What I did also as a preventative maintenance, this car's ABC system, I was pretty sure it had not been maintained. So I actually fla flushed all the hydraulic liquid and uh, installed a new filter. That it was a DIY job, it was very easy. It took me about half an hour, if anything. And um, also it cost me like just the cost for the filter. The ABC filter is 55 uh, Swiss francs and the hydraulic oil, I paid 135 francs for it because I bought 12 liters because I thought I needed 12 liters. But in reality, I basically needed seven or eight liters. So I still have a bit, uh, a bit of spare oil. Maybe I'll do another flush, I don't know. Um, I also bought some random clips for like eight francs to hold like trimmings in the trunk. And um, in August 2016, I did an AC service because my air conditioning wasn't blowing cold anymore. So it needed a refill and um, like a valve replaced. That was 226 Swiss francs. I upgraded the number plate uh, lights to LEDs because they were cracked anyway and I needed new ones. So I got the LEDs, which are legal. They have the E sign and stuff. It cost me 26 Swiss francs. Then in July 2017, I did a large service. Mercedes calls it the service assist A, which is like the daddy where you change your spark plugs and oil and everything. That was also, we found that one tracking arm actually was worn out, so we replaced that. And all in all, it cost me 2,027 Swiss francs. Then, I went again on holidays in Italy with the car and on the way back again I had to break down by the side of the road because the car turned off while driving. So the engine just shut off while I was on the motorway. I just coasted into an emergency bay and then basically the car wouldn't restart. Um, it was, uh, again, I got, a, I got a rental car, drove home with it, and then the car came back on a trailer like four weeks later. Turns out the supercharger clutch had failed. Supercharger itself was fine, but the clutch that engages and disengages the supercharger had um, broken it, basically had shorted whatever it did. And the problem is, even if I disconnected the supercharger clutch, the moment the ECU gives the signal to engage the clutch, the motor would stall. So the car was not drivable and it needed a new supercharger clutch. But Mercedes-Benz does not sell the supercharger clutch separately, meaning you have to buy an entire supercharger. An entire supercharger at Mercedes-Benz is 6,000 Swiss francs. And since I was not going to spend 6,000 Swiss francs to replace the clutch, I bought a used supercharger. 
that cost me a thousand Swiss francs delivered. And then um, the installation and troubleshooting and various things added another 2000 Swiss francs on top. So all in all, that failure cost me around 3000 francs. Ouch. But basically that was the last maintenance item that I've had um, since. So far the car is good, but in total these maintenance costs have added up to 7,523 Swiss francs, which over the period of slightly more than two years is actually a lot. However, these are not the expensive parts of owning this car. That comes when you look at your fixed costs, like insurance. Here in Switzerland, insurance is pretty expensive. Especially if you're a foreigner and a man because you get discriminated against. Yeah, because you're probably also more likely to crash. But anyway, I pay insurance right now about 2,900 Swiss francs a year. However, that is for two cars on one number plate. Because in Switzerland you can have two cars on one number plate. Meaning you switch the number plate over to the car you are driving. And I'm pretty sure the car relevant for the insurance is the other one and not this one. Therefore the insurance cost, I don't know how to split it up. Because if I were just to put all the insurance costs on this car, this car would have cost me in this two years and a few days, it would have cost me 6,324 francs in insurance. Road tax. Road tax is a really important and fun bit. In Switzerland, if you have two cars on one number plate, you pay the road tax for the more expensive car. In this case, it's this one. Because road tax in the canton of Zurich, where I live, is calculated based on um, cubic displacement and weight. And this car, being 5.4 liters and being almost 2 tons, is going to be expensive. In fact, I pay 1,298 francs a year of road tax for this car. That gives me fixed costs of 9,147 francs. Then there's another fun part, fuel. This car uses regular unleaded fuel. I mean, regular unleaded in, in Switzerland is 95 octane. Thankfully, because it's cheaper than the, the super unleaded, which is 98 octane. Anyway, in the time I've had it, I've done 23,571 kilometers and I've used 3,682 liters of fuel, averaging 15.6 liters on 100 kilometers and a total of 5,700 francs in fuel. And by the way, I know these fuel figures because I actually log every refueling that I do in the German site called Spritmonitor.de where you can basically track the, uh, the, the fuel consumption of your car. I know it's a geeky thing to do, but I really like to know what my car really, really, really consumes. Anyway, if we add all these costs together, the cost of ownership of this car, so far in these 794 days that I've owned it, are 22,370 francs. Now, if we want to do total cost of ownership of the car, I have to factor in the sale price. I reckon I can sell this car for pretty much the same price I paid two years ago. So if I manage to sell the car for 20,000 francs, that means my total cost of ownership is actually the same as the cost of ownership. And that makes some fun figures. It means we basically, the car, it would have cost me 89 cents per kilometers driven or 10,284 francs a year or 857 francs a month, 197 francs a week, 28 francs a day. So you get it, owning a car is expensive. Owning an old Mercedes, more expensive than other cars. And so I get to the point of these cheap luxury cars that used to be very expensive and have devalued a lot. They might be really affordable to buy, but the maintenance of the cars 
has not gotten cheaper. If anything, it's probably gotten more expensive because as the cars become older, more stuff will fail and you will have to repair it. So as long as you keep that in mind, I think a car like this can still be great value. And let me explain you why. This car, when new, it costs 225,000 francs. I bought it 14 years later for 20,000 francs. Meaning this car at that point had devalued over 90% of its value. And whoever had to basically pay for that devaluation, the previous owners, they lost a lot more money than I did. And it's not just these cars. I mean, this car was expensive to own for me, but if I had gotten like a new Golf GTI, for example, like something fun, but new with warranty and everything, even that car, new, it's like 50,000 francs. And then two years later, you will easily have lost 20,000 francs in devaluation. So devaluation alone on a new car is gonna cost as much as everything cost me to, to own this car. And even on a new car, you have to pay for fuel. You have to sometimes pay for service, even though often you have free servicing, but they have you pay oil and stuff like that. You still have to insure it. So it's not exactly um, free to own other than the purchase price. So it's always a question of, should you buy a car like that? It depends. If you want a cheap, reliable car, don't. But if you want something that's special, something that's a bit more fun, while still on some sort of a budget, a car like this is not bad. Because compared to a new car, you don't have devaluation. So all you have are really your running costs and servicing the thing. And from that perspective, you can drive 500 horsepower V8 supercharged cars for like 10 grand a year all in, which in my book is not too bad. Because I reckon even a Prius, if you buy like an old Prius, if it's um, if nothing ever breaks, I mean it's a Toyota, and um, all in all, with the same mileage that I did, it would have cost me like three and a half thousand francs a year. So considerably cheaper than this car, but also a Prius. So yeah. I'm not doing this video to this on, on Mercedes or whatever. I really like the cars. I've owned two and I just have the figures. I'm a nerd, I write stuff down and I wanted to share it with you. And yeah, let me know if this was interesting for you, if you want maybe some more experience of car ownership in Switzerland and thank you for watching.